And we're back. Before I introduce our first interview, I'd like to invite you to be a part of the conversation. Please submit your questions via the Q&A tab on your screen. You can also tweet along with us using the hashtag Atlantic Health Equity. And now for a conversation about addressing gender and racial inequities, please welcome Paula Johnson, president of Wellesley College with Atlantic Live contributor, Jean Meserve. Dr. Johnson, it is such a pleasure to have you with us. You have been a trailblazer in researching inequities in healthcare, and you've paid particular attention to gender disparities. Let's talk about that in isolation, if we could, for just a moment. How and where do you see disparities and how men and women are treated? Well, there are there are many, and you know it has not been until uh, really the 1990s that we began looking at these issues in earnest. And what we see is that there are biologic differences between men and women that need to that are translated into uh, how they express disease, which leads to the fact that we don't fully understand those differences, which then leads to inequities in in treatment. So, for example, differences in symptoms of heart disease, different ways of presenting with things like autoimmune disease. Um, the other thing that is quite different is um, the intersection and the need to look at the intersection of race, ethnicity, and sex, and gender. And here is where you also see very significant disparities, both in health and outcomes. So for example, looking at black women, women of color, uh, compared to other women, um, we see many disparities. For example, things like maternal mortality rates, uh, ways of being treated uh, in the healthcare system. So you're a cardiologist, and I'm wondering if in your field in particular, you have personally witnessed some of this. Um, I have. I've spent, before entering higher education, I spent uh, over 30 years in, uh, in academic medicine, both studying this area of sex and gender and health and disease and how it intersects uh, with uh, race and ethnicity. And we've done studies that show these disparities, not only in disease uh, prevalence and outcome uh, and in treatment, uh, but we've witnessed it uh, personally. And I'll give you a story most recently, which is that as we looked at uh, the experience of women of color in COVID, um, we saw that underrepresented minorities had rates of COVID that were much higher um, three hospitalizations three times higher than their white counterparts and experienced death twice as often. When you looked at the risk factors, and if you think about that with regard to women of color, um, issues of risk factors like uh, certain uh, types of diseases, uh, diabetes that can affect your immune system, but if you also looked at their jobs, frontline health providers using public transportation, those lead to increased risk. But with that being said, early data from, for example, the Sloan uh, School at MIT showed that uh, even when you control for all of those factors, uh, women of color, particularly black women, uh, those areas uh, that had higher percentages of, of blacks had significantly higher mortality rates. So we're really here looking at uh, what is um, uh, differences in the provision of health care, uh, the experience of structural racism. Um, and these are um, areas where that, quite frankly, we have known about for quite a long time, and we've studied for quite a long time, but we've not gotten truly serious about addressing them and remedying them. So you mentioned data. Talk to me more about that. Do we have the data we need to truly understand what's happening? Well, what I would say is we have the data sometimes, and um, we uh, often don't report the data. So um, let's just use the pandemic again as an example. Um, early in the pandemic, uh, it was you know only 13 states that were reporting data uh, by uh, both sex and race. Um, that improved, but by nowhere, no way did it get um, uh, perfected. 
And in fact, the New York Times had to use the Freedom of Information Act to get the CDC to release uh, the data, particularly on race, so that we could understand um, how not only uh, represent, underrepresented minorities did, but also how we would look at that intersection of race uh, and, and gender. Um, so sometimes we have the data, but often it is not reported. Now, here's a good some good news is that, um, you know, women and minorities were not mandated to be in NIH-funded, National Institutes of Health-funded uh, clinical trials until the early 1990s. But it really wasn't until 2016 that the NIH began requiring that data be reported both by sex and race and ethnicity. Um, and it was only in 2017 that we uh, really had um, sex as a biologic variable uh, required uh, to be not only included in studies, but also reported. So again, I think we're on the right path, but we have a very long way to go. And our policies will only be as good as the follow-up uh, to uh, to ensure that they are adhered to. I'd love to have you uh, look at the medical profession for just a moment. Uh, I haven't heard a lot of discussion today about implicit bias on the part of healthcare practitioners. How big a factor do you believe that is in your own profession? Um, well, what I would say is that um, implicit bias is a problem across. Uh, across the country. And it has been shown over and over through any number of uh, validated studies that, uh, that quite frankly, we all have it. Um, and physicians and other healthcare providers are no different. And it's been shown over and over again, some of the ways in which care uh, is, is different based on those biases. The treatment of pain, for example, in women and in women of color, shown over and over again. Um, but here's the, I think the point should be that we have the opportunity at this critical moment when we are focusing on these disparities to really make a difference in the way that we train young physicians. I mean, so for example, we should be thinking for uh, young people how we train them to read clinical studies, uh, bio, uh, natu uh, basic science studies more critically, how we train them to, to understand that when studies do not include certain factors like sex, more for basic science as well as for clinical, and race and ethnicity for clinical studies, and when it's not reported that these studies are absolutely flawed. It is also critical that we began to really, we begin to rethink medical education so that our young healthcare professionals understand that race is a social construct, that it's not a biologic differentiator. We need them to understand that when they see these differences in rates of disease, that this is not a biologic factor, that there are many determinants, including so many of the social determinants in health. This is where a lot of these early implicit biases become cemented. Um, we also have to ask the, uh, the next generation of scientists to really ask themselves, uh, and test themselves as they think about not only the study, their, the design of their studies, but the provision of care. Um, are they thinking about issues of social justice? Are they thinking about issues of equity, both as it pertains to race and ethnicity, but also as it pertains to sex and gender? So these are all things that I think we today understand from an educational standpoint can change. We just must have the will to do it. Do African Americans, for example, get different health care from a black physician than a white physician? And is one of the things that is a must do uh, is creating more diversity within the, the core of health care workers? Well, we know that creating diversity is critical, and we have nowhere near uh, reached what our uh, early goals were. Um, and, uh, and this is truly a problem. We know that uh, although cultural competence is critical across the spectrum for all of our healthcare providers, all of our physicians, 
it does make a difference when we have a significant number of physicians of color. We change the conversation. We model. We um, are able to influence um, how the care is provided, how, what the questions are that we ask. So we have studies that show when there's concordance between patient and physician, that actually um, those patients are listened to differently, that they are, that there's more attentiveness to understanding the context of their disease. Um, so yes, uh, we have shown that the care is different. We've also shown, for example, there's a study from Florida showing that when there's concordance uh, of race, um, that the maternal mortality rates, which have been really increasing overall in the U.S., but are double for black women compared with white women, that those mortality rates decrease. Now, um, I think part of that is because these patients are listened to differently. This does not have to be how it is all the time or into the future, but it does set a standard to say, here is a difference in care. We need to understand that difference. We need to increase the number of racial and ethnic minorities and women, racial and ethnic minority women. And we need to learn from those experiences so that they are generalized. Do you think that digital health um, will help close the gap? Um, I think that is yet to be determined. Um, what digital health can do is it can help access, um, but access is highly dependent on the kind of technology you own. We don't live in a country where that access is equal. I saw that up close and personal this past year when we sent all of our students from Wellesley College home. And there were those who were in lovely places and those who had no internet access that we did end up providing along with the hardware, but had no internet access. So as we think about telehealth or digital health, we have to think about what is the infrastructure. And again, who are we going to be as a country as we think about equity? Are we going to ensure that every American has access to the internet? Are we going to ensure that there's a strong public health system? Um, I think unless we do those things, we will see many of the same inequities that we see in one-on-one -on -one healthcare marched out to digital healthcare. Um, the other thing about digital health is that um, unless we're talking about video, but even with video, for those of us who have been on Zoom all year long, we understand that there are aspects of body language, there are aspects of how we communicate that you miss, the cues you miss when you are not in person. Those are critical in us understanding the context of disease, the relationship building that occurs. So lots of work to do. Dr. Johnson, we're almost out of time. Quickly, your one, two, three recommendations on what we should be doing. Write your prescription. Um, so I think there, there are a few things we should be doing. One, we need to reckon with who we are as a country. Uh, are we gonna invest in equity and in the infrastructure that's necessary? Two, we need a really deep focus on public health. Um, and not just healthcare delivery in the one-to-one. -one. Um, we need to routinely disaggregate public health data by sex and race and ethnicity. Um, the NIH guidelines as sex is a biologic variable need to be adopted by funding agencies, by medical journals and pharma and device companies. And lastly, we really need to rethink the education that we offer the next generation of scientists and physicians. Dr. Paula Johnson, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Jean, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Throughout the day, we'll hear from patients and physicians for what we are calling Ideas Out Loud. They will help us deepen our understanding of the health inequities we're facing and bold solutions needed to enact change. For our first video, please welcome Maria LaMonica, writer and advocate with the National LGBT and the Cancer Network, making the case for intersectional equity in healthcare.
My name is Maria Vincenza La Monica. I am 35 years old, and when I was 31, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, first treatment didn't work. Second one kind of worked, uh, and then we, because uh, I relapsed, and then I had to get a bone marrow transplant, which um, almost died a lot, but. I'm here, um, and I can say that I had really phenomenal care during that, but I am also white, cisgender, and I had access to private union health insurance, and uh, even though I'm a lesbian, I can pass as straight. But that is not everybody else's experience. In fact, I feel that I'm the exception that proved the rule. So while I was really lucky to have just the most incredible, inclusive medical team, I also had treatment in one of the most liberal cities in this country. Um, when I got into the support system sphere, I found a few gaps. I also would have really appreciated an LGBTQ plus environment. I think what a lot of white people don't understand is that when it comes to intersectionality. It's not about like, oh, everybody's equal. It's about equity. So if you have a black trans woman, those are three intersections of oppression. And with every layer of oppression, you need to have an equal layer of support. When you're dying, when you think you're gonna die, um, when you're in those situations, um, you, you would not, you cannot underestimate how important community is. When you have cancer, when you're surviving cancer, like sometimes cancer is the easy part. It's it's the after part. It's it's the recovery that's the hardest part. Even if you never have a reoccurrence, you it still sticks with you. Every time you have a cough, every time that you have an ache in the back of your mind, you just think, is is my little monster coming back? Is this is this another thing? And if you don't have a group of people saying to you, no, 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 this is fine, I had this, go check with this doctor, everything's okay, that's, that is so beyond reassuring. And everybody should have that. For a conversation about treating the most vulnerable, please welcome Toyan Ajayi, president and co-founder of CityBlock Health, with Van Newkirk II, senior editor of The Atlantic. Well, Dr. Ajayi, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we dive in, I do want to remind the audience uh, to submit your questions, and we will try to get to some of them at the end. Uh, so we'll get started. Can you give me your elevator pitch? Tell me more about CityBlock, uh, how does it work, and what communities do you serve? Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so CityBlock exists to radically transform the experience of care for the most vulnerable communities in this country, for people who struggle with a confluence of the sequelae of a social system that undervalues individuals with chronic physical health needs, people who struggle with low income, people who have mental health challenges, all of those who have really, really experienced what it looks like and feels like to be poor and to be sick in this country. Um, we provide integrated primary care, behavioral health and social care delivered in person as well as virtually in our community hubs or clinics as well as in people's homes um, that's tailored towards really meeting the needs of people who have often been left behind. Um, we partner with health plans and um, at-risk providers and we take a model of care that allows us to be aligned with long-term value. Um, so we enter into value-based contracts where our economic benefit is tied to helping people live healthier, safer lives in the community. Um, we've been around for about four years now, and, uh, and we serve people in New York, in Massachusetts, in Connecticut, in North Carolina, in Washington, D.C., and hopefully soon um, uh, we continue to grow across the country. Love programs in North Carolina. Um, <laughs> you, I, I do want to take us one half step back just a little bit. You mentioned this integrated approach that takes into account all these different factors and, and uh, can help meet the needs of people at these intersections of really thorny uh, of different needs. But can you talk to us about uh, 
how their needs might not be being met in the current traditional medical system and what specifically um, is being addressed with your model. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just about everyone um, has experienced the United, Healthcare, the United States healthcare system. And most of us have found it really hard, challenging for ourselves or for our loved ones. Even people who have access to resources, who are well-educated, who have private insurance, who have choice and agency, encountering the healthcare system is scary, it's complicated, it's not streamlined, and it doesn't always feel like people are really focused on our own best interests. And so when I think about all of those sort of baseline characteristics, and then I apply the lens of um, marginalization and of complexity of needs of the population whom we serve, the existing system is broken. And so I, you know, I like to sort of explain this in human terms. Think about um, a, a person who, say, has a, a couple of kids, they're a single parent, um, they struggle with mental health challenges, they've had trauma in their childhood, um, they have trouble sleeping, they have three or four chronic physical health conditions, and they're struggling to make ends meet, um, working a couple of jobs and trying to keep a roof over their head. The traditional healthcare system would make it really difficult for them to access the services they need. If you need to see a primary care doctor, you need to call a clinic. Typically, these providers are oversubscribed, don't have enough time to spend with people. You may have to wait several weeks to get your appointment. When your appointment comes due, you have to take time off work. You have to find childcare, get transportation to go to the clinic. You get there, you wait, often a really long time because the sort of experience of care is not super customer friendly. Um, and if you're lucky, we know this, you may get 17 seconds out of your mouth before your provider, the physician or the nurse practitioner or the physician assistant interrupts you, just telling your story and explaining why you're there. Um, if you're lucky, you'll get 10 full minutes of a clinical encounter, half of which might be spent with someone who's focused on the computer because they've got a document and get through to the next patient. And if you're really lucky, you'll have someone who writes a prescription or makes some recommendations that may actually have a chance of helping you, but they don't know anything about the barriers you're facing. They don't know that you perhaps don't have enough food to, to take with the insulin they prescribed. They don't know that you can't afford the copay. They don't know that actually the reason why you're not taking your um, depression medications is because you're struggling with panic attacks as well. Nobody knows this because we don't have visibility into, into the systems that really influence your health and well-being. And all of this is provided in a system of healthcare that really undervalues paying for the primary care and community-based services and supports you need to stay healthy. And so what does this person do when they're feeling really unwell in the middle of the night? They go to the emergency room. Because actually, if you're poor, if you're marginalized, if you're unwell, if you're alone, the only place in our system today that actually is obligated to show up for you 24-7 is the emergency room. And that makes no sense, of course. That creates the problem we see today in healthcare, right? Our costs are through the roof and our outcomes aren't great at all because there's no incentive alignment around doing the thing that this person needs. This person would have needed somebody to come to their house, to knock on the door, to visit them on their own terms, to open the fridge and talk with them about what they eat, to see the kids running around and start to understand the challenges that they're facing, to make sure that they're available 24 seven, to ensure that even if they write a prescription, um, the job is not done. The job is done when the person actually gets healthier. And that's what we provide at City Block. We're, we provide the end-to-end -end experience of care that fills in the gaps left by our existing healthcare system through real personalized um, engagement and trust building and relationship building and recognizing that health is much more complex and much more involved than simply um, the intermittent primary care experience that most people get today. Wow, that is an incredibly compelling pitch for City Block. <laughs> Thank you for that. You mentioned uh, behavioral and environmental factors. Uh, as you, as we know from looking at the history of healthcare in America, those are two things that have been very purposefully broken off from our understanding of, of medicine and of health and of health insurance coverage. Why are those things, uh, why are they so important? in putting together this integrated uh, model of, of healthcare. Yeah, you know, it's it's just being realistic about how we live. We as humans are so much more than the organ systems inside us, than our lab values, than the medication that we take. We are social beings. Our minds, our mental health, our psychological well-being 
directly impact our physical health and our outcomes, as does our social ecosystem, our relationships, our past experiences. It's all intertwined. And I think that the place where we got stuck as a system way back when is that we got so focused on health care as opposed to health. And when you take a step back and say, what is our goal? Our goal is to provide health, is to create health, is to create healthy communities and individuals. Then it is obvious that our mandate goes far beyond, you know, your kidney disease or your hypertension or your nephrology. Like it goes to everything about the way we as humans interact with our ecosystems. And as soon as we recognize that and say, actually, it is our job as healthcare providers and as healthcare organizations, if we truly want to achieve health, to care about this stuff, to make it our business, to care about this stuff, then we broaden the aperture. And then all we have to do is figure out how do we pay for it? How do we incentivize it? How do we structure it? But it is absolutely 100% clear that if our goal is to make people healthier, um, then we have to think about way, 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 way more than simply the purview of traditional health care. Well, uh, that leads me to the next question. How do we pay for it? How do we incentivize it? How do we structure it? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this is the irony of, of where we find ourselves. And honestly, this is the joy of my work. It's there's there's not a lot of opportunities to create a business case for doing something that is also the right thing to do. And here we have one, because the fact that a person who's struggling with homelessness or food insecurity or anxiety and panic attacks, their only recourse often is to go to the emergency room to get treatment that is way more expensive than they probably needed and doesn't actually solve their problem. It merely puts a finger kind of in the hole in the dam. That's crazy. It's, it's, and that's how our healthcare system is structured. Um, and so there's a huge opportunity to create a, a business case and an economic alignment that basically says, look, we spend, we as the country, we as taxpayers in this country across between Medicare and Medicaid, um, so state-funded health insurance for folks who are lower income or dis have disabilities, and Medicare, federally um, supported health insurance for people who are older and who also have certain qualifying conditions, we spend one and a half trillion dollars providing health care. And we spend most of that money on things that don't actually deliver health that are reactive to all of the ways in which our ecosystem has broken down and failed people. So what if we take some of those dollars and invest them upfront proactively in community-based care, in primary care, in mental health services, in accompaniment, in case management, in solving for loneliness, for hunger, for um, isolation, for trauma, and we can actually keep people out of the hospital, keep them healthier, keep them in their communities, part of their society and save money. And so there's a real opportunity here without adding additional dollars to the ecosystem to just be much more intentional about how we spend our resources and orient them towards health and towards the outcomes that actually drive benefit for society as a whole. Now, I wanna make sure that uh, we, uh, uh... Before I get to my last question, I tell people in uh, the audience who are watching, make sure you get your questions in uh, so we can ask them. Uh, so the question I have before we get into the Q&A uh, is, for me, I mean, for lots of people who have health insurance, one of the main ways we interface with, with health care uh, is through the insurance provider, right? People go in, uh, to their uh, insurance portal, find out which doctors they can visit, which ones they can't. They often go to the same portal for specialist referrals. Um, a lot of things are really centralized and information is centralized in this way. How do you reach people who are likely not really well served or served at all by those systems, who don't have that information, who aren't necessarily able to pull up online uh, a list of, of accept providers? How do you reach those folks? Yeah, you go out and find them. Um, I think I love the, the question. I appreciate it because it's it's such an important part of um, how we are successful is we have to make it our business to find people who have all sorts of barriers to accessing um, health services and health information. And we don't wait for them to come to us. We don't wait for them to go to the emergency room. We don't wait for them to make an appointment. We go to find them and we make it our business to find people. We employ um, a large team of individuals from the communities whom we serve, um, people who reflect the demographics, the lived experience, often um, uh, the community orientation of the folks whom we serve. And we empower and equip them and we make them our emissaries to go help us find the members who we're trying to serve. Because showing up, not just physically, but also 
um, uh, with, with open arms and with a trustworthy demeanor is so important in helping to bridge the gaps that so many of these individuals have faced. Because it's not just technical gaps. It's not just, hey, I don't have um, you know, a computer attached to the internet so I can go online and check the portal. It's also, hey, for many of the folks we serve, the last time we encountered the healthcare system, I felt terrible. I felt belittled. I felt unwanted. I felt unseen. I felt disrespected. I'm not going back there. And we, we saw this so much during COVID, right? We saw just how deep and pervasive um, earned mistrust in the healthcare system is. We've done this as healthcare providers by not showing up as trustworthy, by not showing up as available, as truly aligned with the values and outcomes that our members want. And so we at CityBlock have to rebuild that. We have to overcome all of those barriers. And we recognize that we can't just sort of, access is not just, hey, we're here, the doors are open, come on in. It's we're available, we're accessible, we're trustworthy. We're making it our business to find out what matters to you and make sure it matters to us too. Um, that's a huge part of the work that we do and the way that we're able to deliver benefit to the people whom we serve. Now I want to get to one or two uh, audience questions. Briefly, we have one from Robert. Uh, he asks, how does a healthcare organization make a simultaneous social and moral case, uh, both economic case, long-term, uh, and a business case, short-term, uh, return on investment, on fostering equity in health and healthcare? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of steps to this, and we're trying to take all of them. The first is to say, of all the places that we could spend our time, our energy, our talent, our resources, building innovative solutions in the healthcare ecosystem, we choose this place. We choose these people. We choose communities that other people look past. We choose a segment of the market that individuals tend not to want to care for. We choose to value the voices and experiences and the care and the outcomes of marginalized, lower income communities with our energy. And that's important. That that in, in and of itself makes a statement. And because of the way that um, poverty is racialized in this country, because of the way that disease is racialized in this country, because of the systemic and systematic repeated repeated um, uh, racial outcomes that we see based on discrimination, based on the historical institutionalized racism in, in all aspects of our system, simply by doing what we're doing we are serving a disproportionately marginalized population. We are serving people who are over-representative communities of color, over-representative people who've experienced trauma, and certainly almost universally represent people who've experienced the violence of capitalism and the way that it undervalues health for everyone, for the entire population. So that's thing number one, is we shine a light there and we focus our attention there. We do not believe that it is possible to build for the top 1% and then let those innovations trickle down somehow. You have to build intentionally for the people whom you serve. The second thing you have to do is you have to recognize that in order to be successful in, in a business model that is predicated on actually people getting better, not just buying your healthcare services, not just coming to the clinic, but getting better, having better outcomes, that your entire success is predicated on your ability to speak to, to engage, and to partner with the community we serve, which means we're for the first time actually building a consumer brand and a consumer experience targeted at lower income people in healthcare. I care how they feel. I care that my net promoter score at CityBlock is consistently in the high 80s and low 90s. I care that we are delivering experience of care that people want and that they resonate with and that they feel sees them and respects them and dignifies them. In that, we are also creating equity. We're valuing the voices and experiences of people who otherwise would not be valued. And then I think the third thing is recognizing that our internal organizational culture is what is reflected in the experience of care that our members receive. And so we have to build a culture internally and, and actually rebuild healthcare in, in cultures around principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, really having the conversations about what it feels like to be inclusive, what equity really means, not just for the members whom we serve, but also for our city folks, for the folks that we employ, because that in itself is also a radical act, particularly in healthcare. Now, I want to thank Robert for that question, and I think we're going to leave it there for now. Uh, Dr. Jai, thank you so much again for taking the time to be a part of this event and for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. Now for a conversation from our underwriter, Amgen, to discuss breaking down barriers to clinical trial diversity, please welcome Maria Chagog, 
Health Equity and Diversity Coordinator at the Lazarex Cancer Foundation, with Pando Motsipe Tezeo, Global Executive Medical Platform Lead of Bone and Nephrology at Amgen, and Global Chairperson of the Amgen Black Employee Network. Hello and good day. My name is Panda Mutsapedi Tejo and I'm the Global Executive Medical Platform Lead for Bone and Nephrology at Amgen. I'm also the Global Chairperson of Amgen's Black Employee Network and I have the pleasure of leading Amgen's RISE team, which stands for Representation and Clinical Research. This is a newly created team dedicated to improving our clinical diversity. I'm so excited today to be here with Dr. Maria Chagog, Health Equity and Diversity Coordinator at the Lazarus Cancer Foundation, to talk about how we can come together to break down barriers and increase participation in clinical trials, especially amongst historically underrepresented communities. So Maria, good day, nice to see you. Good day, Panda, and thank you so much for having me. I look forward to the discussion. But let's talk a little bit about clinical trials. Now, we know that clinical trials have lacked diversity and proportional representation for decades. Um, at Amgen, this is an issue that we began addressing as far back as 2016 through our ABIN, which stands for Amgen Black Employee Network Employee Resource Group. We know that Blacks represent 13% of the U.S. population, but only 5% of cancer clinical trial participants. We also know that Blacks bear a disproportionate share of the cancer burden in the United States. Um, they have the highest mortality rate and yet the shortest survival across racial ethnic groups for most cancers. Now, I know at the Lazarus Foundation, you've had several important programs that help address barriers to greater diversity. Can you tell us a little bit about the work and, uh, that's being done in the IMPACT program and some of the results that you've seen to date? The IMPACT program is one of our, we, it was, was our first program we did in partnership with um, Mass General Hospital is our pilot project. From the Mass Gen program where we saw that the, that the, the trials were, had a market increase in diversity and participation, we, we then went into what we created, the Community Impact Program. And the Community Impact Program, we partnered with Drexel University in Philadelphia. From there, we're now forming the Cancer Wellness Hub. So it's been a data-driven, um, but people-focused, community-focused program that, that um, allows us to be able to better connect with the community, be in the community, so that when cancer arises in an individual or a loved one, they know where to go. One of the things we found out through um, our work with, with um, MassGen was that there was a lot of people who had anxiety about going to mm -hmm. these big cancer centers. It was intimidating. We follow up to make sure that they get the information they need and the information so they can make good decisions. And if it includes participating in a trial, we also make sure that they some of the toxicities financially based will be removed so they can participate. Wow, that's incredible. It's incredible to see the tangible results um, that the IMPACT program is, 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 is already showing um, and some meaningful differences that you're already making in the lives of patients. You know, you, you spoke about the intimidation of sometimes, you know, patients not feeling comfortable to go to these uh, very large institutions. It's, it's very true and very real. I've heard that um, several times. Um, you know, I've, I've also had the pleasure of hearing firsthand from a, from a patient myself recently. Um, Ricky is a breast cancer patient who is diagnosed with stage 3A triple negative breast cancer and underwent treatment. Um, a year later, she was told it had metastasized and had two years to live. Well, that was 10 years ago. Um, and, and, you know, Ricky shared and spoke about some of the unique challenges that Black women face when it comes to a breast cancer diagnosis. Um, you know, breast cancer mortality is approximately 40% higher among Black women compared with white women. Um, black women also have a 2.3 times higher odds of being diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Can you share a little bit about what you have learned from your work and what you think the key barriers to clinical trial participation are? One of the biggest things um, is access. And access, we think of usually when we say that word, is that people don't know 
how people don't like that people cannot walk in someplace and get services, but it's even access to the knowledge about clinical trials. There is one, a fear of being a science project or test, like, you know, that these things are not safe. There's also that kind of fear that I'm not going to get what I need and then not knowing what you need and not knowing where to find it. And looking at the barriers that you've described, um, who and how do you think we can fix it? So whose responsibility is it to fix and what can we do? I think we're in a really great position because it's not any, it, the, the, the burden of change does not rely on any one person. The burden of change is on everyone. I think that, you know, providers can become more aware of, of, of where the clinical trials are or else organizations like Lazarex so that they can make sure that their patients can get the help they need. I think pharma, especially as they're creating their protocols um, for clinical trials, they have the opportunity to be more purposeful in how their population or how their participants will be set. I think patients have an opportunity too. Patients, one, have to become, um, I, I, I believe in patients are their best health advocates. So they have to learn how to become an advocate for their person. Absolutely. And I think there's lots of conversations around, you know, decentralized clinical trials. COVID has also really highlighted the opportunity for telehealth and telemedicine, which are things that we can do and, and utilize more um, to help better participation. But one thing that's very clear that you're saying is that, you know, it takes a village, right? There's no one person, one industry um, that can help improve this. And it, it's a journey that rests on all of our shoulders. At Amgen, we wholeheartedly agree that pharma can play a critical role in breaking down these barriers. I actually lead this team and our primary objective is to conduct all of our clinical trials in ways that are fully inclusive and equitable representation of all the patients who are afflicted with the disease um, that we're seeking to treat. But with that said, you know, we've set ourselves some ambitious goals to exceed the current industry benchmark uh, for representative enrollment here in the U.S. within the next five years. And we'll be looking at selected therapeutic areas, including, including oncology. Um, as you know, Amgen has a very rich pipeline, and what we will do is we'll focus in disease areas that disproportionately affect racial and ethnic minorities, including cancers such as colon, prostate, lung, and multiple myeloma. And, you know, while we are very proud as Amgen of the significant strides we've made to date, we also know that we have a road ahead of us. And, you know, you and I, Maria, have talked about some of the challenges, but we look forward to continuing to focus on breaking down barriers and increasing participation in cancer clinical trials among historically underrepresented communities. So, Maria, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure um, talking to you. This is such an important conversation, some good nuggets that you've shared. And thank you for all the inspiring work that you and the Lazarus Cancer Foundation team are doing for patients. It's a pleasure having had the opportunity to talk to you today. It was great speaking with you, too. Thank you. Still to come on the Atlantic's Health Equity Summit, Nadine Burke Harris, Surgeon General to the State of California, with Kate Julian, Senior Editor at The Atlantic. For a conversation about expanding access to care, please welcome Cheryl Pegas, Executive Vice President of Health and Wellness at Walmart, with Atlantic Live contributor, John Donvan. Dr. Cheryl Pegas, thanks so much for joining us. We're very excited to have you with us. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, and please call me Cheryl. All right, I, I will do that. And, and, and the reason that it's so exciting to have you here is I, I just want to explain to people who are watching that you're in a really, really interesting position to be taking on the topic that we're discussing today of, of healthcare equity. You're, you're a cardiologist practiced for a long time, but you also you also have worked at the sort of system level of healthcare. Uh, you've worked at Aetna uh, and, um, and, and Pfizer. Um, most recently, you were at Cambia, I, I believe, as well. Now, you're um, the executive vice president for health and wellness at Walmart. 
massive company, massive number of employees, massive number of locations, massive number of customers who are all potential patients. I, I don't want to get ahead of you in describing that, but tell us about, about that population that your the company you now work for from a healthcare perspective can have really interesting insights about. Yeah, and, and I, I think there are a couple of things embedded um, in the question and the way um, we're, we're looking at the work. First of all, our associates, 1.5 million in the US alone, live in all of these communities. So this is not a, how do you go out and provide health care for communities. It's really how do you provide care for your associates who live in these communities? And with what you're doing with your associates, it benefits the entire community that they're in. You've mentioned our size and health equity. And so I'd say those are combined um, for us. 4,000 of our stores are in HRSA designated medically underserved area. 4,000 of the 5,100. Um, by definition, the solutions that we've provided um, over time, and Walmart's been providing healthcare solutions since our first pharmacy in 1978, it's allowed us to provide care in communities where there are sometimes there's no other access. And so the, the first part of that is the importance of pharmacists as part of the care team and the abilities that they do when they're performing at the top of their license to allow them to provide the care that communities need. The second piece of that, I think, as you think about it, is how our thinking of what healthcare includes has expanded um, from when I trained to today where we recognize that 40% of healthcare is social determinants, about 30% is personal behavior. Only 20%, which is where we spend most of our US dollars, is actually in clinical care. Um, and so it's overweighted in clinical care as opposed to healthy food, healthy environments, how do you self-manage when you're not in a physician's office? And obviously, just so anyone who's counting the 100%, there's another 20% that is environmental genetics that we, we don't look at. So there's 80% of care that we should be able to have an impact on. Um, at Walmart, the way we look at it is if it's truly fresh food, easy access when you have a question, um, health literate in your communities and affordable, um, that's a place that we believe the rest of our business is built on. And so healthcare feels as if it's a natural fit for the larger organization. And, and, and Joe, it's really interesting that you're saying, I think would not occur to a lot of people who haven't given it thought that your, uh, your, the company you work for, Walmart, is already involved with the healthcare and, and providing healthcare to, to the, the communities that are often most challenged in terms of equity, rural communities and underserved populations. And I'm wondering, given that perspective, what insights, if any, emerged during the pandemic about sources of inequities? Anything, anything that was new or surprising, or did it merely confirm confirm what we think that we already know are, are the things that are responsible for healthcare inequities? Yeah, and 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 what I would say as you you think of that question, John, is that health equity gained a great deal of prominence dur during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. For those of us who my um, public health background um, is in looking at gaps in care and socioeconomic status and social determinants of health, um, it was actually a great moment that everyone noticed it and a little sad that everyone felt that it was new. Um, because if you've been looking at cardiovascular disease, in particular maternal health, um, pick an, almost any disease state, these gaps and um, health disparities have existed for just as long as I've been in healthcare. It's why I went into healthcare. Um, and so the ability to look at it at a lens that now that we're all looking and talking about it, what does it mean to have actions? Because I think we've documented that these exist. Today, during a pandemic, how do you actually get everyone to get immunized? And so what are the actions you take during a, a time like this? And which of them can be translated 
into sustainable models for improving care in those communities. And we've done it a, a couple of different ways. Um, one, as I've mentioned, we're already in those communities and our associates live in those communities. And what we know um, from the science on healthcare engagement is that the best people to engage a community are the people from that community. Mm -hmm. And so we spent a lot of time um, with our own associates with, as uh, everyone remembers, as the science came out every month, um, I was now learning new science about coronavirus and everything else about variants and new drug studies. We actually, hopefully in a health literate manner, brought down to all of our associates what it meant um, and why two vaccines, why mRNA vaccines. Here is what the studies show. And then had them do a bit of a train the trainer of if we started out with physicians and pharmacists doing it, what did it mean when it was a business owner talking about it? And what did it mean when it was a frontline manager talking about it to an associate? That actually has served us well. That's such an interesting insight. What what did it mean when it was uh, an employer, a manager, lower level manager? What what did you learn about that process? Yeah, we learned that trust and existing relationships are everything um, mm -hmm. in healthcare engagement and in healthcare adherence. Um, so it's great that I'm able to answer it. I kind of say, give it the stamp of approval, if you will, that a healthcare expert. Um, says that this is the science is good, you should take a vaccine. Knowing that your manager or the person you work with every day um, also can speak and say, here's why I am getting this vaccine, here's what it means, here's why I believe it's safe and I understand why it's safe, matter 10 times more. Mm. Um, so trust in communications and trust by someone you already have a relationship with really matters. It's why pharmacists are so effective. Um, they're accessible. They don't speak in you know the healthcare jargon um, that we sometimes do. And they answer the real questions that someone has about fear, about a drug-drug interaction, about whether I can afford it. Um, we try to use, again, some of the best practices that the literature has told us to bring that to our associates and then taking it out to the communities in the same way. So Cheryl, when you use the term associates, it's what uh, it, it's, it's Walmart speak for what most of us think of as employees. So you're talking about the Walmart. That is workforce. correct. But you also have, <laughs> I think the number is 150 million customers coming through the door every week. And there's the whole issue of, uh, of healthcare delivery to that population. Um, the the dynamic that you're talking about, that trust that can happen with among coworkers, is that trust replicable? And are are you working on on building that? And is it essential between Walmart, the healthcare provider, and and the the individuals who are the people? Again, I'm not sure what term that you would use a, a, a customer, a patient. I'm not sure what that would be. Yeah. But those 150 million. What about the trust issue there? Yeah, I, I think that's that's exactly right. And so uh, today, when people think about trust, and and we see this, um, people choose um, to shop or to spend their dollars or their time with organizations that they believe have the same mission as they do, because people have options and choices. And healthcare has moved much more into what we in healthcare call a consumerism market, where people have different ways that they can access healthcare based not just on their needs, but on their, their dollars and how they spend that. And the way we look at it at, at Walmart is we approach people with care, with respect, we remain human-centered and provide the lowest cost. And so the trust that people have is that one, almost all of the people who are working at Walmart come from the community that they're coming from and where they're shopping. So there's that first, like us, um, piece that's occurring. The second piece of it is that the values that we stand for and what this company was built on um, have remained quite consistent in the way we approach these rural communities and these underserved communities in making sure that we are providing them with the best value for their hard earned uh, dollar, but also with the ability to access um, healthcare and us at Walmart overall 
in the ways that they can. So you've talked a little bit about the numbers coming through 90% of those people uh, within five to 10 minutes of a Walmart were open seven days a week. Um, we allow ourselves to provide services with community health workers um, within our health clinic facilities. Again, taking it to where people start to be, build that relationship, build a trust, and someone's asking them about not just you have high blood pressure, here's your prescription, but asking the real questions. Um, do you have access to healthy food? Do you know what those options are? I'm happy to help you select that. As you've looked at your medications um, that you're taking, can you afford them? Here are programs that we have either at a $4 cost or at a $0 cost. Do you have a physician um, who you can see? Yes, our pharmacist can answer questions, but one of the reasons we're launching our national telehealth offering that we've just acquired is in many of these communities, right? If we say 4,000 in medically underserved areas, by definition, does not have enough primary care, mm -hmm. um, we will be able to provide that nationally for many of these communities. And so our goal is not just in, here's what we think we should do, but it's in listening to the community and hearing from them, here's what we need. We do a lot of listening. Um, we take a lot of feedback and we allow that to guide um, how we improve these, these communities one by one. What's the channel uh, through which that feedback travels? So we do it in a couple of different ways. Almost every um, interaction um, that you have, we actually get um, consumer survey feedback from the pharmacies, um, from our health clinics, overall Walmart. I will tell you on a weekly basis, we get to hear all the good and all the bad and all the things that um, we look at as opportunities. And it works. Our NPS scores in our pharmacies hover around 80. Same thing for our health clinics. And we look at it weekly. Um, we're really focused on, are we giving you the right experience? And as you know, when you look at NPS scores and experience, it tells you if people are trusting you for other solutions and offerings that you may um, be able to offer them. So, so the kind of model that you're talking about, you know, essentially, 4,000 medical geographical medical locations in that happen to be in the zip codes that are uh, often uh, most challenged, plus telehealth. It, do you think that that model is a significant piece of the solution to healthcare inequities? And it's, it's one to a degree that can be uh, replicated by companies like CVS and Walgreens, et cetera, that the, the sort of private sector getting involved in a very public way in healthcare. Do you think that this is a critical part of this, of, the, of, of a future where we are trying to address healthcare inequities? I do, but I wanna go back to um, the, um, the comment before of what makes up healthcare. 40% um, mm -hmm. of healthcare is social determinants, which means fresh food, right. um, which is there, access, the there. Yeah. ability to do self-management, be that I'm monitoring my blood pressure, um, at home, um, the ability to get um, access to low cost prenatal vitamins, um, as well as access to whatever um, other needs you may have um, in understanding maternity. It means understanding that personal behaviors has a lot to do with behavioral health and mental health care. And so when you think of organizations, we are the largest um, producer and supplier of low cost fresh food in the country. Um, when you think of footprint in rural and underserved communities, we're it. Um, so I, I think every organization has a role. I think for the things that we know impact healthcare, that are social determinants, personal behaviors, and then clinical care, if we really begin to look at it in that order from children's care all the way to, to the care of seniors, um, we believe that those components are absolutely necessary. And yes, people also need to be able to get low cost pharmaceuticals and physician care. Um, those, and those things are the starting point um, of you feeling as if you can manage your life, manage your world. And if you're an employer, um, helping to lower healthcare cost. And so I, I, I think that matters in being able to do this in that holistic 
manner and looking at all of the components of healthcare. Very quick side trip to the telehealth question. As you mentioned, Walmart has acquired a company that's going to allow uh, ER physicians and, and other healthcare providers to have that connection digitally with uh, consumers out there, patients. Again, I'm not sure which is your preferred term. Um, how, how do you address the digital divide, though? Access to broadband being a challenge for many people, access just to the hardware. Um, is, how, how do you work that into the solution that we're talking about here? Yeah, it's a great question, one I get asked a lot. Um, so I, I think uh, you're hearing me um, almost with all of my answers go back to the data. Um, so actually healthcare, as in many aspects of our lives, have moved to, to mobile platforms. And you look at if you look at the most recent Pew data, 80% of people in an underserved community has access to a smartphone. Um, really, really important for us to remember that actually in many of these communities, landlines don't exist. So though we focus on broadband, actually landlines have disappeared in those communities. And they use their smartphones, I think there's great Pew um, data that also shows, even for searching for jobs, um, many companies recognize that it has to be done mobily on a phone. We think so as well. Um, many people carry their care with them. Um, they have a lot of solutions um, that they utilize that a smartphone enabled. We look at digital healthcare as being able to use that mobile connection that many families today use. And even as we look at some of the managed Medicaid plans and other programs, they actually include those solutions. And it's not just for healthcare, it's for all of the other services that families may need. And so we believe it is a key component. And there's a lot of great studies, even within the pandemic. Cedar sinai did some work that's been published um, that shows that for underserved communities, the use of telecardiology actually decreased um, the um, inpatient uh, utilization. So based on some of those, I think those, they're just, just great opportunities to see how far we can go with what already exists. And yes, there will be gaps, right? The opportunity is how do you start and maximize what you can do today as some of the, the, the other gaps, which is smaller, right? If, if 70% of care um, is, is what you've got to focus on. I think there's some nice opportunities if only 20% is clinical care where smartphone access really enables that. Well, our takeaway from this is not to think of healthcare delivery just in terms of um, the, the, the vaccinations and the doctor's visits, but it's a system. And you were talking about a, a system and a systemic approach. Very, very interesting and very interesting to hear your perspective. Dr. Cheryl Pegas, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And the only other thing I would say, it's not just a systems approach, it's a team-based approach. Um, really important for us all. Thank you. We heard you, thank you. Thanks again to all our speakers. We're going to take another quick break and encourage you to check out our virtual expo booths down below and you can network with other attendees to discuss today's event. Also, we wanna know what worries you the most about the state of public health on the right-hand panel, click on polls to respond. We'll see you right back here shortly.
are here today and over the next few days to explore this very strange year and to try to figure out with our guests where we're headed. We are living in a very divisive society right now. For the voters who were denied their right to be heard, that should anger you. What are we doing here in this administration? We had a hard time getting candidates even to just say Black Lives Matter. I will stay in jail for the rest of my days rather than make a butchery of my conscience. We are going to use every moral nonviolent tool at our disposal. It was time to make the case that human rights and women's rights were the same. This is such a powerful moment. This is how we're all living. We're living through a mass rejection of reason. We lost about 80% of our business in eight weeks. By the time this is done, we'll be at over $20 trillion of total economic cost. I just got a message. The Republicans may let the CR go on a voice vote. If so, do you want to call for a recorded vote? But leave it up to standing. I am just... If you have to run the House of Representatives from this interview, that's fine. Our society wants us all to live in a box and eat hamburgers and watch dumb TV. Everybody has a compelling story if you're just willing to listen. It's we the people that make the difference. The goal here is to create participation. And we can use our voices to make sure that we hold people accountable. There are periods in American history when we've made large, profound leaps forward. here today and over the next few days to explore this very strange year and to try to figure out with our guests where we're headed. We are living in a very divisive society right now. For the voters who were denied their right to be heard, that should anger you. What are we doing here in this administration? We had a hard time getting candidates even to just say Black Lives Matter. I will stay in jail for the rest of my days rather than make a butchery of my conscience. We are going to use every moral nonviolent tool at our disposal. It was time to make the case that human rights and women's rights were the same. This is such a powerful moment. This is how we're all living. We're living through a mass rejection of reason. We lost about 80% of our business in eight weeks. By the time this is done, we'll be at over $20 trillion of total economic cost. 
just got a message. The Republicans may let the CR go on a voice vote. If so, do you want to call for a recorded vote? But leave it up to Steny. I'm just... If you have to run the House of Representatives from this interview, that's fine. Our society wants us all to live in a box and eat hamburgers and watch dumb TV. Everybody has a compelling story if you're just willing to listen. It's we the people that make the difference. The goal here is to create participation. And we can use our voices to make sure that we hold people accountable. There are periods in American history when we've made large, profound leaps forward.
Welcome back. I'm Candace Montgomery, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Atlantic Live. A quick reminder, you can be a part of today's conversation by submitting your questions by the Q&A tab on your screen. You can also tweet along with us using the hashtag Atlantic Health Equity. For our final Ideas Out Loud, please welcome Arabia Millette, an emergency medicine physician sharing solutions to eliminate systemic racism in healthcare. Hi, I am Dr. Arabia Molet. I'm an emergency medicine physician or ER doctor in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in, in, a, in an impoverished community. I had a hard life. Um, and there were several tragedies that occurred in my life, and that was the death of my son, uh, the tragic death of my sister, and when it's in my mother attempted to commit suicide. When the paramedic and the cop came to my mother's, uh, to our apartment, the cop said to the paramedic, you know, she's nothing but the N-word. And I was only 12 years old. And they looked at me and they laughed. And in my heart and in my spirit and my mind, said, how can you be someone that's supposed to serve the community but you look down on us? So that was one of the, um, the, the tragedies that inspired me or encouraged me more to become uh, a doctor because I didn't see too many people like myself in emergency medicine. The health inequities, uh, the health disparities that, um, that I've seen have been in existence since the inception of slavery here in the United States. I'm not speaking just off the fact that I'm a doctor, I'm also speaking from a person that was raised in an impoverished community in the South Bronx. And in these in, in marginalized communities, public hospitals do not receive fair and equal funding. Therefore, we were working with limited resources. At the initial part of the pandemic, Black and Latinos, and including Native Americans, let's not forget about them, and Pacific Islanders were actually blamed for dying at a disproportionate rate without necessarily explaining why, what was the main cause of them dying, that they were um, disproportionately impacted by chronic conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and other ailments, right? However, when we talk about these these pre-existing conditions, we, we, we have a tendency to skip over, the again, the root cause of it, which is food insecurity, environmental pollution, again, racism. And so because of these iniquities that's been existing for well over 400 years, of course you're gonna see the, uh, these marginalized communities be more impacted. There's no national health literacy campaign that is culturally sensitive and competent to be able to teach people more about science. For example, I remember at the height of the pandemic, um, a lot of people didn't believe that COVID-19 was here. A lot of people didn't believe that New York was getting hit. If we had uh, a national, cultural, uh, competent or sensitive um, health literacy campaign in the United States, it can combat misinformation. I think one of the things that is really important that we need to um, do as a nation is increase the number of applicants, black and brown applicants into medical school. Um, most of us who are black and brown tend to go back to our communities to provide adequate health care. But how are we going to do that if we don't in increase the enrollment of black and brown medical students in medical schools? And also provide leadership opportunities for uh, black and brown doctors so we can have more doctors that represent the community, that understands the community. Here to discuss diversifying the healthcare workforce, please welcome Elena Rios, President and CEO of the National Hispanic Medical Association, with Catherine Wu, staff writer at The Atlantic. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you all for joining me today. Uh, Dr. Rios, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, great. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, before we dive into uh, our conversation, I do wanna remind the audience to submit your questions and we'll try and squeeze a few in at the end. Uh, but we can just get started here. Um, my name is Katie, I'm a staff writer at The Atlantic and uh, we're very happy to be interviewing Dr. Rios today. Um, so, Dr. Rios, uh, according to the CDC, um, 
Hispanic Americans have been twice as likely as white Americans to get COVID, three times more likely to be hospitalized, nearly two and a half times more likely to die from COVID. Uh, what is the root cause of these disparities and what should people know about what is and isn't causing this? Well, I think uh, social determinants of health are what we talk about in terms of a population or a community awareness of how people live in this country. And many Latinos in, in general are more poor and less educated, have uh, essential jobs uh, that we now know are called essential workers, uh, but really live check to check and have very basic uh, uh, quality of life, let me just say. Uh, and also live with chronic diseases because they get diabetes, cancer, heart disease, early on, but don't take care of uh, themselves in terms of going to a doctor and finding out that they do have these diseases and are not medicated. And by the time they show up to an emergency room because they have chest pain or, uh, you know, some type of infection that doesn't go away, and, and then they find out they have a diagnosis, they're in later stages of disease. So their immune system is compromised. And with COVID, which has been a horrible pandemic, as we know, these are the people that get COVID faster and with, with uh, you know, a stronger impact. Um, so that's part of the reason. I think just living in a cycle of poverty with so much toxic stress has been an incredibly, um, you know, horrible life uh, that has been here forever uh, in, our, in our country. I think the underserved communities uh, were targeted in the 1960s to have clinics, community health centers, to have Medicaid. Um, and uh, and also to try to find a way to, to help our communities actually have their own doctors that take care of them. Right, and I think, you know, as you just laid out here, these have been problems that have been limiting access to good care for a long time, long before the pandemic even hit us. Uh, why are these issues so persistent? And, you know, is there a way to keep the momentum going to make sure that people remain aware of these issues even after this current pandemic starts to wane, especially in this country? Well, I, uh, I got trained in public health school in the 19, late 1970s on small area uh, planning. And uh, at the time, there were planning agencies set up in every state with counties that have planning uh, boards where hospitals and clinics and you know nursing homes, et cetera, could really take a look at what resources were available in a community and decide how to share major equipment like CT scans, for example, CAT scans that came out mm -hmm. right way back when. Well, when Reagan, President Reagan became president, he was the governor of California, right? He abolished this concept of a government-focused planning uh, resource redirection uh, because he wanted the, the private sector to handle health care. And I think health care has evolved as one silo of, you know, of resources uh, with some government funding. We know a lot of government funding is in Medicare and Medicaid. But then there's this public health system that got ignored. And the public to now the turn of the century, you know, 2000s, where we have very little public health in our communities except for surveillance of where epidemics are or where bad diseases are, like tuberculosis, you know, communicate uh, infectious diseases like tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, now COVID. But we don't have the infrastructure that we really should have had if we had gone in the direction of having a, a real planning, a system-wide system planning and sharing of resources in this country. Uh, so I think that's part of the problem. Absolutely. So, you know, as president and CEO as of the National Hispanic Medical Association, uh, I know that you were leading efforts to make sure that there's awareness about these issues and to hopefully start rectifying some of these disparities. Can you tell me a little bit about that and how some of these efforts have been focused, especially during the pandemic, during the past year? Yeah, during the past year, we started with uh, education, education efforts through webinars. So we, uh, we have a monthly COVID-19 brief briefing uh, for the public, for professionals, 
about what's happening in our communities and try to get the word out about how you can learn from doctors that are on the ground in nursing homes, in intensive care units, in emergency rooms, and what they were doing, what they were finding out. Uh, same, we're doing the same thing now with vaccinations. We have a campaign called Vaccinate for All because we felt that it, it's not just an in one person uh, role and responsibility, it's the whole family. And the whole family mm -hmm. needs to understand, the messages to our community need to be about family, that you, by getting vaccinated, you're protecting the whole family. Uh, even if you think you're not sick, especially younger people, now that we have vaccinations available for, for uh, uh, you know, teenagers, adolescents, they need to understand that even though they don't think they're gonna get sick, they could transmit the disease a lot faster if they're not vaccinated. The other, the other thing I think that we've done, and we've continued to do this even before COVID, is to focus in on how we can develop a diversity in, in medicine. Uh, because the more culturally competent, language proficient people we have that are the caregivers, whether they're doctors or community health workers, you know, no matter what level of healthcare, we really do need to see more Latinos take advantage of the education uh, stay in high school, stay in college, and be prepared to get into uh, a really, a, a very fulfilling job in healthcare, especially in our communities that need it so much. Yeah, that, that is absolutely something that I would like to return to in a moment, but you brought up uh, the very important topic of COVID-19 vaccines. And I did want to ask you, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about vaccine hesitancy, but I think that has sometimes been conflated with limited vaccine access. Uh, what are the roles you think those two factors play in getting Hispanic Americans vaccinated? Uh, what are the biggest factors that are keeping vaccination rates low across different groups of people, especially this one? The biggest factor is lack of information. We see a lot of Latino patients that are on, you know, that take advantage of, of media, TV, radio, and especially Spanish media, has a lot of misinformation that the vaccine's gonna give you the virus, you're gonna change your DNA, there's some chip in the virus, uh, in the vaccine. Uh, it's, you know, and then of course we have a lot of problems with the undocumented and people who, who were very fearful of the uh, Trump administration's call to change uh, public charge. And the public charge was actually dropped, you know, after COVID started, but the community didn't hear that. They thought that if you were found uh, to, to go after va uh, a vaccine as seen as a government program, if you're gonna go after any kind of government programs, SNAP, food stamps, or Medicaid, or housing va vouchers, was the first time that you could actually be deport deported, even if you were just waiting in line for 10 years for your green card. And that public charge issue nobody realizes how impactful that is for a whole family to protect the one person that might be undocumented in the household. We have a lot of, of mm -hmm. uh, multi-generational households. That's another problem, uh, you know, with people wanting, not wanting to leave, uh, you know, and stay, keep uh, elder, elders at home. Um, so, so just a lot of misinformation. And then, and then the, uh, probably, you know, one of the other things that happened was so how do you take care of yourself? Do you wear a mask or don't you wear a mask? Uh, you know, the, just a kind of, a, you know, the flip-flopping of some of the messages that, that came through COVID-19 as we saw it evolve over the, over, the, over the year. I've seen a handful of, uh, I guess, mobile vaccination clinics that have been able to uh, bring vaccines to communities more directly instead of concentrating them um, in centers where they might not be easily accessed by all groups of people. Uh, how big of a deal do you think this is to efforts? Do we need more of this? Is there something that these efforts could improve even further to increase access and increase education? Yes, I think, I think we really do need door-to-door -door education. We do need community health workers. Um, I think what happened was um, the government and really thought, well, let's just get a uh, you know, the let's get FEMA out there and have mega sites without thinking, well, how are people going to get there? Uh, especially people that are disabled and can't walk. Uh, you know, you need wheelchairs. You need, you need, so mm -hmm. I think a lot of barriers to, to these mega sites weren't uh, thought through. 
So the idea of going to where the people are, going to pharmacies, for example, was a lot easier to get to. Uh, but e the, the mobile clinics are even easier for those that have to be at home. You know, when I grew up in the 1950s, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of trucks that went through the neighborhood selling donuts, what, what have you. But uh, I, uh, even the milk used to be delivered to, to homes. And, and I think we've gotten away from that, thinking that everybody can go to a, you know, can get in the car and drive or in the East Coast, get in the subway and, and go. But there's a lot of people that are homebound uh, or don't have a car. And, and I think transportation and then again, child care. And, and then the adults in the, in the families are all working, trying to do what they can to, to survive. And, it, and they just don't have the time to, you know, to, and they don't have the, uh, the payment structures in place in our small businesses that are the, where most employees work, uh, you know, for small business. Absolutely. Uh, I'll bring this back around to another thing you mentioned that is really crucial about education and representation, which is, you know, focusing in now on the medical profession. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's been conversation for many years about increasing diversity, but uh, recent surveys have shown that, you know, uh, one from the Association of American Medical Colleges showed that less than 6% of doctors who filled out the survey identified as Hispanic. Uh, how does this figure compare to what's been seen in, in previous years? Is this stagnating? How can we get that number higher? And what what are the big hurdles here? Again, uh, historically, we have um, people that are marginalized. And yeah. in medical education, uh, in general, you know, same for dentistry, nursing, public health, right? But let's just say medical education in general is a is a club, is a profession, and uh, it has a legacy to it. So you see the sons and daughters of the professors or of the uh, donors to the medical schools still getting in first. Um, then you have people that are very well qualified from the biggest, you know, the prep schools in the country, high schools, colleges. And uh, I mean, I got to go to Stanford University. I was, you know, amazed, uh, but started understanding the differences in people in, in our class system, if you want to call it that, our income levels. And the lower income levels, most of our Latino students that get, get into medical school are still first generation, first person in their families to even get to college. And so th there's a lot of other reasons, but th th we don't have the information passed on to our communities that your sons and daughters can be doctors. Uh, I even went to a, i just tell you a story. I went to a, a in Arizona, went, went to a meeting. Uh, I was a speaker about getting into health careers. And we were meeting with the school boards of, of the, you know, the high schools and the, uh, and, and, and it, the school boards were made up of, of people from the community. And there was Hispanic school boards, uh, school board members who said, you know, we don't, we don't tell our students that they can become doctors because they can't. We know they can't. And, and it's like, well, wait a minute, who, who's allowed those, those rumors or that misinformation to continue? So we're mm -hmm. our own worst enemy when our own families tell their students, the parent or their children, right, that they should get married and get a job and continue to live as well as they can and that they're limited in what they can do because they're never going to get a job in a big hospital because they won't accept you. And so there's a lot of... Um, uh, Mis I'll just say misinformation, but on the other hand, there are cream of the crop, very qualified math and science students that are now going through STEM programs. You know, thank God that the government has a focus on STEM. I think with, with the computer revolution, the informational revolution that we live in, there's a lot of need for students to get into math and science. Well, these are the same students that can become doctors. So what we've done, the National Hispanic Medical Association, we've been funded by the Office of Minority Health to have a college health scholars program where we have mentored, you know, uh, almost a thousand kids, college students interested in different health careers, but we're matching them with mentors who actually got into medical school or dental school or nursing school. And, and I think the mentoring 
because we have some, we have a few professionals, you mentioned 6%, 5, 6%. We have professionals that need to be linked to the students because our families don't do it. The schools don't do it. Counselors don't know. And I think the beauty of the network is, is the networking and the mentoring is that the students need it. People don't realize that, you know, sons and daughters of doctors just don't automatically go to medical school prepared. Mm -hmm. They were prepared from childhood pre-K to learn how to, uh, you know, study and, and, and discipline their mind to be able to be critical thinkers and not just, you know, not just go out and work. And um, the other thing we've done, and I think this is important, is training is now changing because accreditation is looking at how do we get medical education to be more diverse. There's now, you know, uh, positions created at the administration level, right, within the faculty to have a diversity, a chief diversity officer or, or you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion officers. So that this is all a good step. It'll take a generation for them to do anything, to have an impact, because the pipeline isn't there. So we really need to do the pipeline, and then we need to have this, this momentum at the medical education level to find leaders among their faculty who can continue to promote the curriculum and the role modeling. But we, then we need the leadership at the top. You know, we don't have any Hispanic medical schools on the mainland. In, there's a, you know, the, the four in Puerto Rico, but there is not one, you know, we have Hispanic centers of excellence that were created by HRSA to mirror the historically black colleges. But the historically black colleges are in one place, you know, Morehouse in Atlanta, Howard in DC, and they don't move around. The Hispanic centers of excellence are given a, you know, half a million dollars for three years or five years, and then all of a sudden the money's taken away and and they goes to another school. And all of, there's a Hispanic center and you know, I'm from California. There's a Hispanic Center of Excellence at UCLA one year, and then it's in San Diego one year. Now it's in San Francisco. Well, you know, the Hispanic people are living in certain pockets of the country. We really need to regionalize and have the mentoring and the recruitment with Hispanic Centers of Excellence with top leadership in the same place. And, and, and we also need to have more money support for for the infrastructure to be created at these centers of excellence and in our communities targeting, uh, you know, grammar school kids. They, they say by middle school, if you're not good in math and science by middle school, you'll never be because you can't, you, you don't have the confidence or the discipline mm. to, to do the math and science. So, you know, what we're doing in college is probably too late, but we're finding, I mean, we actually had about 2,500 college students apply to our conferences. We, we've been running five conferences a year before COVID. Last year, we, you know, we had to go virtual. But we'll go back to having in-person in conferences because when you have the conference, students find each other, their advisors want to bring the students, and, and then all of a sudden, we've, we've got a group of students that never knew they could get into medical school. I mean, they, they, they actually get more confidence and they, 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 they can, uh, we can increase the pipeline if we can, we can do this, you know, in a, in a more uh, consistent basis with, with other partners. Uh, well, I, I really look forward to seeing the outcome of, of all of this. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there for now, but thank you, Dr. Rios, so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. For a conversation about the role of states in health policy, please welcome Nadine Burke Harris, Surgeon General of the State of California, with Kate Julian, Senior Editor at The Atlantic. Hi, it's so nice to be here with, uh, with you today, Dr. Burke Harris. Um, you are, of course, the first Surgeon General of California, but I think to many of our listeners today, you may be 
equally well known for your work on what we call ACEs um, as a physician and as a public health voice in California in recent years. So I was hoping that we could actually start there. We all hear this term ACEs a lot, but I think we stop to think about the numbers and the, the sort of real impact um, that this category has. So can you give us sort of the view from 30,000 feet on what that is and why it has mattered so much to you over the course of your career? Absolutely, and it's a pleasure to be with you this, today. Um, the term adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, comes from the landmark research study that was conducted by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente now over two decades ago. And what that research study found when they looked at 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences, these include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence or intimate partner violence. Um, what they found were two things that were pretty striking. One is that uh, these experiences are incredibly common. About two thirds of Americans have experienced at least one, and one in eight folks in their, in their landmark study had experienced four or more. The, the other thing that they found was that there was a, a strong dose response relationship, meaning the, the higher the exposure, the greater the risk of a negative outcome between not only between ACEs and not only things that we kind of intuitively recognize, uh, things like um, uh, mental health disorders, depression, anxiety, uh, suicidality, uh, behavioral health concerns like um, uh, substance dependence, but also with uh, common health conditions, including heart disease, stroke, cancer, and, and Alzheimer's and other serious health conditions. I, I, whenever I read these numbers, about the effects of ACEs, I have to say they really stopped me in my tracks. So I'm wondering, could you help us to just sort of put some of what you're saying into numbers? Like, what are we talking about in terms of, for example, the effect of, of having five or more ACEs on one's life expectancy, say? Yeah, so um, with life expectancy, it is pretty striking what we see for individuals with actually six or more ACEs, the difference in life expectancy is 19 years. So those with six or more ACEs uh, on average die 19 years sooner than those with zero ACEs. But when we see look at things like uh, the leading causes of death, uh, for heart disease, for individuals with four or more ACEs, we see more than double the risk of heart disease as compared to individuals with zero ACEs. For uh, stroke, it's uh, two and a half times the risk. For chronic lung disease, it's uh, more than triple the risk. And so you see on and on, we're talking about really sig substantially increased risk of major health concerns. Thank you so much for um, for humoring me with that sort of um, quick lesson or briefing on ACEs. What I'm hoping to sort of make the jump from um, is sort of how your work on that. And I know that when you were in um, your residency at Stanford, you were working in the Hunter uh, Bayview neighborhood of San Francisco, which is a lower income underserved community. And this is sort of one of the things that got you very focused on the effect of these early childhood experiences on long-term health. But if we sort of jump ahead into your current role as Surgeon General, what might be the connection between one's childhood experience and some of the disparities that we're seeing now, for example, during the COVID epidemic in terms of COVID outcomes. Could you just walk us through that quickly, sort of what you see when you look at the numbers in California and how, how those early childhood experiences might actually be one of the real drivers here um, of these disparities? Yeah, so um, what we've, so what the science shows us, right? So part of the reason why the ACE study was so significant was because it alerted us to this profound link between our experiences and our environments and our health outcomes. 
And in the intervening years between the time the study was published and now, what we now understand is that uh, when we're exposed to things that are stressful or traumatic, it activates the biological stress response. If that happens too frequently or too intensely, without adequate buffering supportive interventions, that can lead to prolonged activation of the biological stress response something that scientists now call the toxic stress response. And that leads to changes in brain structure and function, the immune system, our hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. And so that really explains the increased risk for these different health outcomes. Now, what we now understand is that the 10 traditional ACEs that were identified in the study are not the only risk factors for developing the toxic stress response. And so we see that other factors like uh, the accumulated hardships of poverty or experiencing the atrocities of war or even experiencing uh, discrimination can also lead to this prolonged activation of the biological stress response and increase the risk of uh, negative health outcomes. One of those so, risks that we go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I please, please continue. I, I, <laughs> I have lots of questions I'd like to ask, but I'd like to hear you out on this. Yeah. So, um, so, so one of the uh, increased risks um, that we see is to the immune system, right? Because the the our stress hormones profoundly affect our immune system. And so as we look now at some, you know, as at a myriad of, of health outcomes, um, but uh, particularly, you know, we, we think about it in, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, right? One of the things that we see is that individuals who experience high dose, who have experienced high doses of adversity uh, may be at increased risk of having negative health outcomes uh, when faced with infectious disease, when faced with other health challenges. So in your role as Surgeon General, sort of what are your thoughts on what you can do at the state level to try to deal with some of these upstream causes of health problems later in life. We spend so much time, as you know, on the downstream uh, part of it, the sort of acute care. What can the state of California do? Um, you know, you're in this enviable position now. Tell us, position now. Tell us what you're trying to look at, sort of what your more pie in the sky dreams might be. Yeah. So one of the big challenges that we have is that when we look at the impact of early adversity, there's still this misperception that it's up to the individual to just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And in general, we don't get great outcomes in a systematic way when we use that approach. And that's why when, as California's first Surgeon General, my role is really to look at the science and apply this to how we approach healthcare in California. So California made a huge investment and really has, is leading the nation in standing up the first ever initiative to train our healthcare providers systematically on the science of adverse childhood experiences, toxic stress, how to screen for ACEs and how to uh, recognize the signs of toxic stress and respond with evidence-based interventions. Uh, it's called the ACEs Aware Initiative. We launched it in California in January of 2020. We have trained almost 19,000 healthcare providers on how to screen for adverse childhood experiences and respond with evidence-based care. And you know, all of that has happened in the context of the pandemic. I know that Governor Newsom has also proposed uh, something like $4 billion in the next state budget for behavioral health care for Californians under 25. What's the sort of dream as to what that looks like? Can you walk us through a little bit of the thinking? That's right. So this is uh, the, the governor has proposed in the budget 
as you mentioned, $4 billion to really create a comprehensive uh, children and youth behavioral health system. And it really starts with recognizing how important that, that behavioral health is health, right? So there's the, the body doesn't stop at the neck and it's really important for us to implement a, a really comprehensive system. And it goes all the way from prevention with investments to help to do public education, reduce stigma, raise awareness and improve our behavioral health literacy. It's increasing access to services, both through school-based services for children and youth, and also by training and augmenting our pipeline of providers. And uh, it, it also includes increases in, in you know, bricks and mortar, more uh, places where folks can get care, more uh, acute care beds for individuals who do need to have a more intensive intervention or need to be hospitalized. Um, but it also includes a, a platform, a, a, an information technology platform to really link all of our services so that we can do a better, more efficient, more cohesive and comprehensive job in providing behavioral health across California. On that note, I think we'll have to say goodbye today. Thank you so much. This has been really fascinating and um, we're really glad that you were able to join us. Oh, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Here to discuss the power of prevention, I'm joined by Susan Vataparampal, Associate Center Director of Community Outreach, Engagement and Equity at the Moffitt Cancer Center, and Karen Winkfield, Oncologist and Executive Director at Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance. It's great to have you both with, uh, with us to discuss community engagement. The first thing I'd like to do, Dr. Wingfield, is to get a very practical definition of community engagement. What is that work? What does it entail? Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. I'm so grateful to have this conversation. You know, it's an important definition, uh, community engagement. Oftentimes, institutions will think of community engagement simply as public outreach. And that's not it, that's not enough. Uh, community engagement is about developing bi-directional communication strategies with community partners, community uh, families, individuals um, around what is going to work best for their particular situation. And the community engagement can be related to anything. Um, we are specifically talking about community engagement around health and well-being. And oftentimes that's something that falls by the wayside in many communities' mindsets because there are so many other issues that they're dealing with. And so I want to make sure that we here are thinking about health and well-being in the holistic sense and that it is inclusive of mental health, as we just heard, but also the social context that individuals find themselves in. Dr. Vataparampal, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the work you are doing. You're, you lead a research team called CRISP, Cancer Research in Screening and Prevention. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, so to, to leverage um, the definition that was provided by community engagement, that really underscores all of the work that we do in our research program. The main focus is getting interventions into community settings that we know work. I think of our research team as the end of a relay race, that we are taking the discoveries that happened at the cancer center in the laboratory and bringing it to community populations. But as you've heard throughout the day, that requires really a multi-level scientific approach to identify what are the evidence-based strategies that are developed by and with community because they know the solutions that work best. Dr. Wingfield, tell us about the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance. Yeah, so uh, the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance has been a strategic partnership that was developed back in 1999 between Meharry Medical College, which is one of the four historically black institutions in the country that has a medical school and a medical practice associated with it, 
and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And it's really designed to leverage the, the assets, the expertise at both of these institutions to say, how can we combine our expertise to truly engage the community, to understand what their needs are, what they're focused on, what things they might be interested in from a research perspective, and how then do we deliver on the the task that we've set us in front of them and in front of us. Um, as you've heard, this engagement is, a, is around collaboration. The community oftentimes knows what they need best. And so the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance is strategically positioned to really leverage the expertise of those two institutions, but also the community at large. What is the biggest single obstacle to getting people screened for cancer? Dr. Vada Parampal, let me start with you. I used to think that it was all about sort of awareness and knowledge, but I have come to realize that really the bigger obstacles are at other levels. So a simple one, when I think about my work in, um, let's say, HPV vaccination or cervical cancer screening or any cancer screening, is actually provider recommendation. So the trust that happens between a patient and a provider is essential. And if we as patients don't feel like our providers are supporting or prioritizing certain cancer prevention or control interventions, then those things are likely not going to be undertaken by patients. Other things that I think about are really systems level issues. So how do we make it easy for our patients to engage in screening if they have to go to another location, if it takes another appointment, if it takes a next step. So I really have come to appreciate that we need to um, take maybe some of the responsibility away from patients and educating to thinking about systems and interpersonal things that happen as a way to improve cancer screening. Dr. Wingfield, would you agree with that or do you have a different conclusion? Dr. Wingfield, are you still there? It looks like she may have frozen for just a moment there. We'll get back to her in just a moment. Okay. Um, uh, let me continue with you, Dr. Vada Parampol. Um, what about fear? Is fear a factor and something that, that keeps people from getting the screening that they should? Absolutely. So we think about, you know, what are patient level concerns or attributes and fear uh -huh. is certainly something knowing the answer, um, how we, you know, what, what might this test show? And I think that's really where beyond education is that trust and rapport and thinking ahead to what patients' concerns might be, addressing those areas like navigation, support throughout the screening process are really ways that we can overcome the fear. I mean, all of us have those concerns, but it's up to us to anticipate and think about how might we allay those? And, you know, we we really need to, to do a better job of walking people through the experience rather than just, okay, they got screened and now, you know, we're done or our job here is done. Uh, another thing that I've heard expressed by some people is the fear of cost, um, not just mm -hmm. uh, the immediate cost of having the screening, but potentially the long-term cost of dealing with a cancer diagnosis. Do you find that creates a barrier and how do you overcome it? Absolutely. Cost and um, those concerns are paramount and very legitimate and true. So at our cancer center, some of the things that we've been undertaking are um, when we have a screening uh, voucher program or free program in the community, we're also committed to making sure that there are resources and navigators to identify how a person might take that next step. And that can very well mean coming to our center and making sure that they are transitioned to our charity care program and that they're able to receive the appropriate follow-up and diagnostics. But I think it's our responsibility, again, to think about all of those things. And if we're going out into community, we need to have the answers at every step of the game and not just sort of ending with um, the screening. Uh, Dr. Wingfield, glad to have you back with us. Let me ask you again what you have found in your work to be the biggest barrier to getting screening. 
Yeah. So, you know, when I've talked with community partners, transportation is really one of the number one barriers of cancer care along the entire continuum. And that includes screening. And you think about the fact that things like lung cancer screening require specialized um, machinery, and it may not be close by individuals' homes. But even things like mammogram, which we think are readily available, transportation can still be a barrier. And I think that's really important. I agree with the, the concept of education as well, but also educating our legislators, because sometimes they think that screening is covered, which it is. But recall that some of our screening is also preventive, um, like colonoscopy. And so if someone has a screening colonoscopy done and a polyp is found and removed by that provider, that now becomes a diagnostic pr um, procedure. And there's costs associated with that. So you've been talking about costs, and that is a challenge as well. Um, so when it comes to diagnostics, uh, that's an important component. So it's not just enough to provide for screening, but we need to provide um, cost-based uh, um, care across the entire continuum, and that includes diagnostics and into treatment. One of the themes in almost every discussion today has been trust. Uh, and I'm wondering, through the community engagement lens, how you cope with that. Uh, Dr. P Dr. Pataparampal, have you uh, come up with some kind of approach that seems to actually be effective in overcoming the mistrust? Yes, yeah, so I think that that is really what the community engagement is set up to do is to build trust with community partners and community members such that when we are going into community with messaging, we're going together with partners. We work with our local federally qualified health centers. We also are creating a presence in the community that's not just tied to a particular research project or a particular study, but through our office, we're able to be there regardless of whether there's a grant funded. And I think those are the really concrete examples of how trust can be uh, built in a community is by working with partners and showing that you're there to stay regardless of whether it's because there's a grant or not. And I feel fortunate to be at an institution where that is our philosophy and our priority. Dr. Wingfield, your approach to the trust issue? Yeah, it's very much the same. Um, you know, when I was the Associate Director for Community Outreach and Engagement at Wake Forest, we actually had a very similar approach. You just need to be present because it's the right thing to do. Not because there's a grant, not because you're asking people to uh, participate in research, but because you really truly want to understand who they are and show them that you value them. And that includes not just the patients that we're hoping to engage, but also providers. So in addition to creating patient navigation services that we used actually lay individuals that were from and of the community with the focus of making sure they had engaged programming that was intercalated into their jobs, but we also engaged primary care teams and providers so that they understood the screening recommendations, which, as you know, change quite frequently, but also that they knew that we were a trusted partner for them. So if they needed information, they had a patient who came to them saying, hey, I was invited to participate in a clinical trial, they knew that they could reach out to our office at any time. And that's important in building trust, not only with patients and communities, but also the community of providers as well. In listening to both of you, what I hear over and again is that listening is one of the keys, that this can't be talking to a community. It has to be taking information from them. Dr. Wingfield, could you expand on that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that goes into, again, this definition of community engagement. Public outreach is just as you mentioned, just talking at people. And I think having public service awareness is, is really important, but we really need to have that bi-directional communication. And so one of the things that I learned during my work at the Cancer Center is like, you know what, cancer sometimes isn't the number one thing that's on people's minds. It's the other components of their health and well-being, uh, that social context, the social determinants of health that are really important to them. And so in my work at the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance, I'm, I'm pleased because I'm able to expand beyond just kind of thinking about cancer care along the continuum, but to think about the other diseases that individuals have on their minds. And so it was really important for me to be able to respond to the needs of the community in a, a, an objective way, but also in a meaningful way. And that's where listening really plays a huge role. Dr. Vada would you agree that listening is absolutely key? 
oh, a absolutely. Hearing what is valued and important to our partners is really the best way to create not only bi-directional engagement, but relationships that are mutually beneficial. And I like to think about it as sometimes our cancer center is in the driver's seat, but many times we're in the passenger seat or the back seat of something that's important to our community partner. And I think we have to be comfortable in all of those roles in order to really hear and respond to what our community values and what matters to them. Is it really going to take door-to-door -door efforts to reach people, to talk to people, to listen to people, Dr. Winkfield? You know, that's one approach, and I am certainly a huge proponent of boots on the ground. I think that that is really critical. People need to see us in the communities. They need to see us where they are. And I always say it's important to meet people where they are. So, you know, sometimes it might not necessarily be door to door, but maybe it's organization to organization. There are already groups convening, whether it be AARP or other sorts of groups that we can actually engage in some of this work. Um, I am so thrilled, as you may you know, I work with a Stand Up to Cancer, and I'm on their health equity core. And you know, they've really strategized as an as a body around how they can work with pre-existing organizations, including Black Health Initiative and others, to say what can we do to leverage those pre-existing relationships to help spread the word about the importance of cancer care along the continuum. And that's another strategy versus just knocking one on one on the doors is really leveraging those partnerships that already exist. Dr. Vadaprample, I'm wondering if watching efforts around COVID-19, uh, you have seen some particularly effective techniques used in community engagement that might be replicated elsewhere. I think seeing the efforts that have been around COVID-19 um, through uh, an organization or a, a group that we call the Florida SEAL Alliance, which was specifically to promote COVID vaccination in under, um, underserved communities, what was really effective was the partnerships. That is that many of us had these trust-based existing partnerships that we were able to leverage, even though they had been focused on cancer, to now address COVID-19, the pandemic, concerns about vaccine hesitancy. So I wish I had a more um, you know, explosive answer, but I think there is no substitute for putting in the work and having those relationships that are ready to deploy, regardless of what's coming at you from a health perspective. Dr. Wingfield, your thoughts on the biggest contributions and learnings from COVID-19? Well, you know, I think COVID-19, for those of us who've been doing this work for a long time, um, focused on health equity, we've learned nothing new in terms of the fact that the problems have been existing. Uh, they've been there along the cancer continuum. We are seeing them in full force in terms of the lack of resources that certain communities have. But I do think there have been some innovative thinking around how we can utilize technology to help support this work in terms of engagement, understanding that there is, is a digital divide we need to think about the fact that in our rural communities, they may not have broadband access. Not every community has access to unlimited um, ability to text and or use a video capacity. Um, so I do think that the COVID-19 pandemic has really opened the eyes of lots of people who may not have understood the depth of the problems. And this is where the partnerships come into play, not only from a community perspective, but also thinking about larger organizations and entities and certainly our healthcare systems are now well aware of some of the challenges that communities that have been traditionally underserved has faced and now can be willing partners in solutions. Dr. Vadaprample, without community engagement, is health equity possible? No. I, that's a straightforward answer because we know that health equity is the culmination of so many factors within our community that are only addressed if we partner and we work together. No one organization is going to solve what has taken generations and years to lead to such disparity that it, you know, there, there is really no other way besides um, working together. Uh, Dr. Wingfield, I, I saw you nodding vigorously during that, so I presume you agree. 
<laughs> yeah, I say that all the time. This is not a problem that can be solved by one institution, one person, one community alone. We have got to work together. And we are seeing that kind of in full display with COVID-19. The response in one community has to be different you know, from another. It requires some concerted efforts around best practices, but certainly we know that this is not an issue. Health equity cannot be solved by one institution. We must work together. We must share best practices. And we have to leave it there. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. We hope today's program was a valuable experience for you. Please take a moment to share your thoughts with us by completing our survey. Your input is very important to helping us shape future programming here at Atlantic Live. You can find a link to complete the survey in the chat. You will also receive a link directly to your inbox following the conclusion of our broadcast. Thanks again to all of our speakers today and to our underwriters, Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, Humana, and Pharma. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you all again soon.